listening to Jason Shanko, who has been here every semester since computers were invented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my first talk was on uh, whether or not Alan Turing was ever going to show any results. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's welcome our guest speaker. Uh, it's my supreme pleasure to be here today um, to talk to you about the technological considerations for VR. Uh, <laughs> before I do, I need to uh, describe a little bit about what my year has been like, which has been a little bit chaotic. Uh, for a number of years, I've been working for Will Wright um, on his project, and I left at the beginning of the year to work with Mark Pincus <coughs> at uh, Super Labs, where he was going to be incubating uh, a new project, um, a new VR project. I spent about the first six months of the year working on that. And then Mark decided to go back to Zynga, and I didn't have very much interest in working at Zynga, and so I've moved on to a couple of other companies. Uh, the notes there, it says I'm at Wildstop, which was a, 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 a phone hardware company, uh, and I've since moved on from there to Fable Labs, which is a storytelling uh, game company. So I'm back, back doing game development. But I did spend uh, several, um, <laughs> Several months this year, well, working on VR systems uh, in Unity and Unreal Engine and things like that. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the technological considerations for VR. So I want to get a little bit of sense here. How many people here have experience doing 3D development of any sort? Uh, Unreal, Unity, anything like that? Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, so OpenGL, shaders, Direct 3D, things like that. Good. Okay, so we're basically I'm, I'm talking to a to a pretty open audience. That's fantastic. Um, let's start off by describing really quickly here the, the market overview for virtual reality. Virtual reality has come on the scene in the last couple of years in a way that's, that's truly remarkable. Uh, in, in, uh, and we are just at the beginning of, of this remarkable bit. All of the projections, this is out of Business Insider, for the uh, uh, market adoption of VR going into the tens of millions uh, over the next uh, decade or so uh, uh, is something that nobody could have anticipated even just a couple of years ago um, for a number of good reasons that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, and so I want to preface my comments by saying uh, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. Okay, uh, I've you know I have a, have a pretty solid background in in, in 3D <coughs> development, especially OpenGL and Direct 3D. You know, it's been a big chunk of my career. I'm working right now uh, quite a, a bit in in Unity and Unreal. These are environments where you s sort of work at a higher level. You don't really worry too much about shaders and, and and scene graph management and things like that and systems like that, unless you need to. And and you know, Lord help you if you ever do need to. Um, but uh, for, for VR, uh, and how many people have ever seen the Oculus Rift, the Samsung device? Okay, how, how many people have ever had a chance to use one to actually see it? Okay, so not, not a whole lot of people yet. All right, good. Um, so this talk, virtually everything in this talk is derived from these guys. Uh, this is, of course, for jo John Carmack, you know, developer of Quake. John Carmack, raise your hand. <coughs> yes, okay. Uh, who's, who, who basically ushered in the era of modern 3D and virtual reality uh, in a way that is, you know, you have to pick one guy who did it. It's, it's pretty much John. If you have to pick the other guy who did it, it's Michael Abrash, who is uh, John's partner in developing uh, the Quake engine. Um, and today, a little more of the younger generation, uh, mo most of this talk is based on uh, uh, advanced VR rendering by Alex Vla uh, Vlachos of, of Valve. I highly recommend uh, anybody who gets in, once you get into a little bit of 3D, and like uh, I've learned a little bit of 3D, check this out. Uh, definitely check this out. It will give you uh, a, a, a backgrounder on where we are today in, in, in VR rendering that is unparalleled uh, compared to anything else that I've seen. Um, but before, okay, so there you are. But first, before we get into John and Alex and Michael's work, I'm going to describe a little bit about the things you have to do in order to succeed at VR. And one of the things you have to do is embrace the past. And so I'm gonna tell you a, a little bit of a story here. It was 1997 was a seminal year in the development 
of uh, gaming and, and, and computer science. Not only was it the year that I first started <laughs> speaking here, you know, which is clearly an incredibly important <coughs> event, but it was also the year that, that Michael Abrash gave his talk at the Game Developers Conference on the internals of the Quake engine. Okay, and, and I attended this talk, and, uh, and it's available online under the GDC vault, and there's a couple of other places where it is. You can't, unfortunately, it's not video, it's only audio. Um, but uh, it's one of the most amazing moments in the history of 3D graphics, basically. Uh, and I remember being at the Game Developers Conference in 97, waiting in line for like two hours for this talk because we knew it was gonna pack out. There was absolutely no way you were gonna get a seat if you just tried to walk in. Um, Quake, uh, Quake, people wondered if they've seen Quake, okay. Uh, Quake had just come on the market the year before and completely changed um, the, uh, uh, what the profile uh, of being a game developer was. It, it, it changed the, the, the paradigm that we were operating under. At the time that Quake came out, um, you know, I was a game developer, a little bit of a graphics heavy kind of game developer, and what that meant essentially is that you were looking for better and better ways of doing Super Mario Brothers. Everything was 2D sprites, scrolling, you were very concerned with like, well how do I make sure that on VSync I can redraw this, basically this flat page of sprites, where the math involved is not too complex, and mostly what you were doing was just trying to figure out the best way to talk to the hardware so that you can get the most action happening on the screen, and so you'd have the most CPU cycles available uh, for physics and for AI and for other things like that. Uh, but the fundamental idea of what am I doing every frame, um, was I'm making a collage of two-dimensional elements. There were a couple of people, uh, you know, who, who were doing 3D development in games. Uh, usually it was about one out of five of us who had some, some sort of understanding. But even for them, most of the stuff they were developing were either very simple environments um, or uh, space shooters, uh, flight simulators, low polygon uh, environments where the uh, uh, most of the scene is just empty, and then you have a little code that can draw, you know, a spaceship or a box or whatever or whatever you're playing. And the math behind this 3D was something that most of us sort of vaguely understood: is linear algebra, matrices, and vectors. Okay, it's fine. Um, but it was a specialty. It was something that most of us didn't didn't really understand how to do. There were some games that were in 3D that were in environments where you could run around, but by and large, these were either very, very hacky kinds of things like Wolfenstein, everyone had seen the old castle Wolfenstein in 3D, right? Uh, or Doom, right? Doom and, and uh, okay. So Doom and Castle Wolfenstein were 2D games, fundamentally. They were two-dimensional games. Um, by which I mean that when you were playing the game, they were 2D games that, that had a, a, a sort of a, a hacked version of what seems to be a 3D renderer. It was impossible in, in Doom or in Castle Wolfenstein to crane your head up like this or to rotate it like that, right? You couldn't get those degrees of freedom. Your eyes, your eye was fixed to the horizon and you were moving along, kind of skating on a 2D plane. And some of the more advanced ones like Duke and, and, and uh, he had like stairs and, and some curved surfaces a little bit, but they, they were pretty much hacks on a 2D system. Wolfenstein was pure 2D. I, I remember I wrote a Wolfenstein engine uh, right after getting the, you know, the game just because the, the, the way that it was laid out was, was interesting to me. And it was just basically you're in the middle of a giant bitmap and I'm going vertically, scanning through the world, finding the first pixel that I hit that's not black, and finding the distance to that pixel, and that pixel's you know, value 0 to 255, or I guess 1 to 255, is a lookup table to a texture. And uh, so I take the distance, I look up the texture, and I draw just a vertical line. And it's always a vertical line, right? I can't crane up and down, I can't bend it, I can't warp it. And that created a world that was just pretty much like a little blocky rat maze, you know, that I don't know if you've seen those online. So none of this was real 3D, and we understood that. You know, it doesn't, didn't even use the, the transformation systems of a, of a real 3D game. Um, and then in 1996, uh, it released, having done Doom and Doom 2, released Quake. And uh, it, it completely changed the way that we saw the world. 
Uh, it was an interior space, okay? Like, this is a game like you have today, right? It's an interior space where you can walk around from room to room, you can crane your head, and I remember uh, uh, the, the first time I, I got the WASD, W-A-S-D, right? For, for yeah, everyone knows WASD, it basically me. And uh, mouse um, controls working on a PC. How just incredibly liberating it was to be able to crane my head, move around, play this game where I'm shooting down, I'm shooting up, you know. And once it got online, my my favorite of these games was, to this day it was Quake Two. We had, I had so much fun, you know, in like 2000, playing with my uh, my chums, blowing each other away in Quake Two. Just the movement through the 3D <coughs> space was so natural and so complete and so just physically rewarding uh, that it was clear that, an entire, that it, this was changing the entire game. Gone are now going to be the days of you know, being able to be a game developer and get by with sprites and little 2D things. And I was working at Maxis. You know, we weren't too heavy on 3D. We had I was, uh, you know, Simcopter and I was working on the streets of SimCity. Um, these were games that kind of over pushed you know, performance a little bit. Got some bad reviews because, you know, they they didn't work too well in a, in initial release, and then the following year, <laughs> you know, the the frame rates jumped up to twenty five and thirty, and people started liking them a little bit better. Um, and it became clear once once we got the chance to play around in Quake that we were going to have to to learn how to build these kinds of worlds and write these kinds of games. So we we couldn't just just do sprites. So a Michael Abrash, who, who was basically the heavy technologist on the, uh, um, on the Quake team, working with John Carmack, who was kind of the visionary. So Carmack would come up with the, the way of doing something, and Abrash would go do it, you know, and that kind of thing. Gave this talk where he basically described how Quake, which is pretty much like a modern, you know, 3D in interior environment, did this amazing thing of of allowing you to see without even 3D hard, uh, hardware acceleration, you know, which was existed at the time, but was it was in its infancy, you know, so things had to render in software. Uh, how they were able to 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 make this incredible scene system, and he described at the time. I won't go into it. If you if you want to search for this online and listen to it, I highly encourage it. Uh, because of the way he's talking about the future, which is our our present, he talks about like, well, maybe in 2010 you'll be able to do that, but right now you can't, you know, whatever. Uh, you hear some some really prophetic stuff, and he's basically talking about how we model the world, uh, you know, of Quake as a series of convex hulls. All right, so a convex hull uh, of a is something uh, is a room where you're standing in the middle in the middle of the room. Anywhere you stand in the room, you can see the totality of everything else. You can see all the walls. There's no little right angles or anything else like that. So like here in this room, this is largely convex, but there's a post in the middle and there's a little gap over there. Those things would be taken out and split into their own convex hulls. <laughs> and these arrangements of convex hulls were broken down to what's called a binary space partition tree which is where you have a, a whole convex environment and you grab a polygon. Uh, no, no, you don't need a convex environment, I take it back. Uh, you, you have any kind of environment, you grab a polygon, uh, like say for the side of that wall, and you make a binary tree where all the polygons that are on the left are on the left node and all the polygons that are on the right are on the right node and that polygon is on the leaf and you, you compose your whole level with this system and this structure is very searchable and you can do collisions and you can figure out what you're going to render. And then you have a, a system, they had a, a system of SGI workstations that would run through the world figuring out which portals were visible from where, creating what's called a potentially visible set so that every node in the BSP tree, they knew which subset of the polygons that are in the entire world were even possible to see from here so they could reduce the amount of processing that has to happen on every frame. And, and, and the solution to this problem was, you know, parts of it were hacky, parts of it were elegant, but we could see that we were, uh, we were coming to the future that we're in now, right? That, that, that the, the, the rest of our lives as game developers were going to be a re revolve around solving, uh, working in these kinds of spaces. 
and, and more and more and more elegant. And then later on in the year, other other games came out. The portal system, you know, which basically that uses convex hulls, and then if there's a, a like a door or a window that opens up the convex hull behind it, and then when you ren you basically you keep rendering until you come to a portal, and when you come to a portal, you load the next node. And so games like Descent would use this uh, idea, and 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 the, the, we could all see that the, the B, that that VR had begun. Right, and that we'd finally come to a place where we could really render a 3D world, not like Doom, where your eye is locked on the surface, not like Mario or anything else, where it's just a you know just a, a sprite game, and not limited to something like Wing Commander or or Flight Simulator, where you're this is true rich 3D, but it's it's a flight simulator. The most most of the screen is empty sky. There are very few polygons being rendered. Okay. The next thing you have to do, though, however, is you have to erase the past a little bit. So in 1997, the one thing that Michael Abrash did not talk about was VR helmets in Quake. And the reason for this is that um, throughout the early 90s, uh, and certainly a little bit further into the, the development of Quake, there were these abortive attempts to, cr to, to create VR. VR had become a hot topic. It was a hot topic in science fiction. Um, and there was this idea that it was just a natural. It's like, you know, you people want this experience. It's, it's in Neuromancer. It's in all of these things, uh, Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, and uh, <coughs> clearly gaming was going to go in this direction. And so there were a number of efforts, uh, including from some very big companies, to get 3D uh, virtual reality systems on the market. Uh, for people to use. And for the most part, what all these systems succeeded in doing was inducing headaches and seizures. Uh, <laughs> they were awful. They were just, the 1990s virtual reality was terrible. Uh, it was essentially just a TV strapped to your face. Um, there was no binocular depth. So you're, you're pretty much just getting a flat image of the world that just appears to be a flat image. It doesn't fool your brain in the slightest. Uh, th there were VSync issues where things were flickering, you know, out of uh, out of control. You you had to control things with your with your hands. Any any time they tried to do anything with with controlling with your head, it would just swarm and, and swirl, and you looked like an idiot. <laughs> and just nobody nobody wanted it. The, the you know the the PC gaming experience had come along nicely, and consoles had been revived. Uh, uh, you know, so people wanted things on their TV and on their monitor, and they didn't want to be doing this. And so it became, it, it just, ev every initiative along to create VR fundamentally failed. So much so that uh, the idea of cranial VR, uh, if you had talked to anybody about it in 2008, you know, in 2010, You'd hear, ah, uh, yeah, maybe someday, but we've never really solved, cracked that nut. That's, you know, just, that's, this is the hula hoop. This is the magic, this is a mood ring. This is the pet rock. It's a fad that died, you know, in the middle of the Clinton administration. Okay. <sighs> Only recently with the development of the Oculus Rift has the idea of cranial VR been revived. And, um... <laughs> So for those who aren't familiar with the Oculus, it is a high performance kind of developer targeted VR head system that plugs into a console or to a, a, a PC uh, via a wire that's connected to your head, okay, which is a crucial element of it. And it, develops, and it produces the best VR experience you can find on the market today. But it requires a wire attached to your head, attached to a computer that can produce high quality graphics. For the consumer-facing market, we have uh, the Samsung uh, VR systems, which basically take the Samsung 6 phone, slot it into a, a helmet that has a, you know, split optics and things like that. And now you have a wireless, free-roaming, walk-around virtual reality experience. But the graphic quality is much, much lower um, because it you know, has to render everything on a mobility device that's right here instead of on a high-end computer that's over there. And so these are the sort of the two VR experiences that we have. You kind of sacrifice quality for mobility, uh, but both of them provide uh, a very compelling experience inside of the virtual environments that are created, far beyond anything you could have imagined in the 90s. Okay, so how do you create this, this compelling thing. Right. 
And by compelling, I, I, I you know, uh, want to tell you that like I was a heavy skeptic a heavy skeptic of, of oculus and everything else it's like people don't want this thing attached to their head you don't want to be in your in your living room playing a video game and your roommates come in there and they're drawing stuff on your body and you're not noticing it because you can't see anything you know uh, it, it, it uh, there's ways of socializing you know with VR because you can be in a virtual environment with other people but it also blocks you out from the social environment that's immediately right around you that's in the real world and that's very alienating and, and it causes seizures and blah, 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 until I had a chance uh, to, uh, uh, to try it out at uh, WebVR, which is a company that is looking at developing a, a uh, uh, basically an editing suite for linear VR uh, experiences. And I, I, I had a chance to experience both the Valve demo, which they had running, and the sort of underwater, you're like on a, sunken ship and there's whales and all this really cool stuff coming around that was just done in unity you know uh pretty much just the artwork was the only effort the programming was was you know close to nothing um and the tracking on your head and the complete you know the complete the totality environment is utterly compelling it's utterly compelling uh to the point where i'm now persuaded that this is going to be uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be, you know, replace the gaming, you know, uh, on a mo on the monitor because there's a lot of advantages to, to monitor-based play, but it is certainly certainly a very compelling system. So, what do you have to do to make the system compelling? The first thing is you have to draw everything twice, right? Um, that's the thing that they weren't doing in the '90s. That that really broke those old systems. Or so there were some efforts to try binocularism, but it just the software that was that you know like running around in Doom, Doom wasn't really set up for binocular, you know, for binocular rendering. And so basically, what you end up having in in uh, in a VR system is you have this frame buffer. And if you listen to that Valve talk, I highly recommend it. You know, I'm swiping all of this mostly from Valve. Um, they'll go. He goes into all of the numbers of pixels and the frame rates and the everything. You just you just if you're a numbers geek, you know, listen listen to Vlachos talk about it. But the bottom line is that you have this this frame buffer, which is normally a, a high res, like a you know a, a, a 1080p kind of uh, thing in a, in a game system. You split into two low resolution images, and you render each of them from a slightly different angle to get the binoc binocular effect that gives you the depth perception that you need. And what rendering everything twice means basically is you have an observer the sort of the pyramid of objects that you can see uh, in a system is called a frustum. Uh, and uh, you have typically some sort of Abrashian system for running around finding all your objects that are potentially visible, breaking down all of your, your polygons, rendering a scene, um, and like that. And the naive approach to this, which no one should ever, ever do, is uh, to uh, just do everything twice. Just you, here's your camera. You have two cameras running basically, and you have two rendering cycles, and you you gather everything once. The, now this is okay for your first experiments. If you want to try something out, if you're going to get into rendering, but it's a hideous idea because you basically uh, do every bad thing that you can possibly do to a 3D system. First of all, processing all of your whole data twice. That's a lot. It's very CPU intensive, right? Uh, 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 and then going through and submitting each set twice when 90 percent of you know with the, the 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 you know the, the screens match 90 percent essentially um you completely lose cache coherency like all the stuff that's in memory by the time you but if i start here and i start reading all these objects and these are rejected and these are accepted and this one's partially accepted by the time i get to here these things have all fallen out of the cache and so if i start here again you know, collecting everything else again, then then my memory's glitching and saying, well, you just asked for that. Why do you, why do you need that again, right? So, pretty much, you want to do all the processing on every object twice as you're processing it, right? Um, and then, if you basically 
render everything into your into your frame buffers. So, th how many people have any sort of understanding of 3D hardware? You know, sort of the way it works. Okay, 3D hardware is essentially a parallel CPU sitting right next to your computer that has the same memory issues and process issues that a, that a general purpose CPU has. And the problem that you have is again is, is cache coherency and things like that. If I draw this, you know. Part this this texture here, and then the whole world. Then come back and draw this texture. It's fallen out of the cache. It's got to reload. Blah blah blah. If I want to draw it here and then here, I should just do it in the same frame. So there are a number of strategies um, which are gone into in the material that I reference for instead of just rendering everything from here and then rendering everything from here, it's rendering everything from both posi positions at once, collecting everything from both positions at once, creating one big. Uh, uh, you know, scene graph draw and putting, and then just doing two transforms on it. It's sitting there in memory. Say from here, from here, and everything is collected, and 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 the and and basically re you render every object from both camera positions into these targets all at once. There are some other uh, strategies that use the onboard, what are called vertex shaders, which do some some translation of vertices for you and things like that for other purposes. Um, Fundamentally, this problem is going to be solved. Okay, and by the time you, most of you get out there, if you're going to be getting into 3D shader development or whatever, this is a classic mid '90s t style 3D problem, which is that every VR system out there has to render everything twice. And right now, the way you do it is you figure out a hacky way to take a thing that's designed to render something once, and get it to render things twice in the in the way that most respects the hardware's texture memory and the uh, the the uh, CPU's uh, scene graph memory okay there will be an accelerated binocular render coming probably next year Nvidia almost certainly have it next year but it's still worthwhile to remember this so the first thing you gotta do you have to draw everything twice okay and this is part of the reason why we have uh, still even uh, even an oculus relatively low quality resolution on a lot of these images because we need frame buffers that can take them you know th that can take two images another way to approach that, that's being used now uh, especially in higher end systems is to have two video cards right and two two pipes to memory and you just blam one video card in one eye one video card in the other eye okay. you have to draw the future so the thing is, with these oculi uh, and the Samsungs and everything else like that, it's, uh, the, the, the thing that makes it so compelling compared to the, you know, the, the, the vomit machines of the 90s is that uh, it tracks your head beautifully. So it feels like real reality. The only thing that's missing is a model of your body, your disembodied floating ghost. But uh, you know, if I look there, I see there. If I look there, I see there. I don't have to joystick control myself to see these things okay um, now the issue is when you play a video game on a console or on your PC the responsiveness from the time that you move your thumb to the time that you see a camera on the screen the lag between that is huge you just don't really notice it because you're watching fundamentally a, t a movie. It's in 2D, it's on a screen, it's distant, it never moves. Things, it, the, the, the world moves around inside of a fixed window instead of a window moving around on the world. Okay, so all of these things that we're used to from television, from movies, from all this kind of <coughs> stuff, we're used to the notion of there being, you know, uh, uh, we're, not, we're not expecting it to, 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 to match the bot movements of our body, except for our thumbs. And we don't have a natural kind of sense that moving my thumb moves my head this way, you know, in a completely precision way. It's okay if it lags a little bit. You don't, you don't notice it. You guys don't notice it when you play on a console. The minute I put it on your head and your head is moving around, the slightest lag, and you start to notice this. And that makes you sick. Okay. Um, and... Everything we've been doing in rendering for the last couple of decades, especially because we got caught by surprise by the idea that VR is coming along, nothing has been designed to fix this problem because it's not a problem on an Xbox. It's not a problem on a PC or a Mac. It is a problem on an Oculus. Okay. And the basic idea is that you have this input from your head 
It goes, has to go through USB. It has to go to your game engine, which has to then process your input and generate all your physics. Then it goes out to the right display system, which is a big complicated frame buffer management you know, thing. Um, it has to execute an entire frame buffer. And then it has to flip so this, uh, the, the, the frame buffer so that you see the new one. And it begins processing the old one. And by the time you've done that, that's not milliseconds. It's, it's, you know, it's tenths of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. But it's enough that your eye catches it when it's attached to your head. Okay. So in order to solve this problem, what you have to do, and again, this is from uh, Val, this is from, from Vlach's uh, talk, highly recommended for <laughs> anybody who's interested in this topic at all. He goes through a tremendous amount of detail uh, describing uh, uh, what you have to do here. But basically, you have this scheduling <coughs> system on your video card and uh, on your CPU that is dominated by what's called V-Sync, um, which is the vertical sync on a rolling shutter style display. Now. VR displays don't have rolling shutters, but they still have. But everything still has VSync. It says when the next frame comes, click bang, click bang. It's a signal that says time for the next frame, time for the next frame, time for the next frame. And what you're always trying to do in computer game development is get everything done before VSync, and then VSync will show what you did, right? So he had goes through this tre tremendous amount of detail talking about how you pretty much have to do a predictive pipeline architecture where you are simulating the next frame while you're rendering the current one. And where, where I'm going to decide what to draw is not where you're looking right now. It's where I think you're going to be looking in you know, x milliseconds, like half a millisecond or you know, whatever it is. Right? Now, of course, the idea of where you're going to be looking in the next half a millisecond or so is uh, you know, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to predict in you know perfectly, but we have an advantage here, which is that the the, the this 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 effect of noticing the world swimming is more pronounced the more even your movement is. So if I make a relatively naive prediction that based upon the your last three frames of movement, I think you're going to be here. Okay, if I'm wrong, it's because you've jerked your head that way or jerked your head that way. You have to be jerking your head around for me to be wrong, and the more you jerk your head around, the less you're. The, the less you're worried about the coherency of what you're seeing. It's when you're doing this that you don't want to see that kind of movement. So the more, uh, so, so the, the ideal cases for, your, for a naive predictor are the ones that actually solve the problem better uh, than, than they will if you're you know, spazzing around so much that you were not noticing that I'm behind you by half a second or whatever, not half a second, but you know, half a millisecond or whatever it is. Okay, so, but you still have to think this through. You have to say, which we've never had to do in games before. I'm not concerned with where the player is looking. I'm concerned with where I think they're going to be looking in, at the beginning of the next frame. The other thing you have to worry about is in games right now, if you lose a frame, big big deal. <laughs> you know, you lose a frame, you fall behind, you stumble for a bit. Eventually, the physics and the graphics catch up. You know, and, and it, you lose a frame all the time. It, you know, especially on especially on PCs or anything connected to the internet. There's going to be some process that takes over for a second. You're going to get a little glitch from time to time. It's you know that that that's the way life is. With a regular game, you can recover. With a VR game, you'll end up so far behind that the thing will be swimming around in your in your head, right? So you have to have these V-sync catch up. You have to notice when you're losing frames, and you have to you have to predict the future. You have to mind the details. I'm going to go into a little more detail on this uh, again, uh, as the, the Valve guy did on his, in his talk, because this is one of the more fascinating topics. Um, OK, so you know, over the course of development of 3D, um, most fundamentally, we're dealing with, with polygons right? uh, that are, in the old days, used to be flat, gerociated, you know, very uh, it's like, ooh, texture mapping was very exciting you know, <laughs> in the mid-90s. Um, and the fundamental idea is that we've been developing tricks over the last couple of decades for making it appear that there's a lot more detail in the world than there really is by creating uh, what are called bump maps and normal maps, which are um, textures. Um, that aren't just imagery, but also provide some idea of how light should react to this, this type of object. Okay, so over here you see an example of a bump map, and I don't know if you can make this out, but bump map versus 
a, a real geometric system. This is a little red ball with some, some texture on it. And you can see this one has real edges to it, right? And real actual crunchy geometry. Whereas this one is actually smooth. But because of the way that the surface material reacts to light, it fools your eye when it's on a computer screen or on a, uh, um, you know, a, a TV into thinking that it's actually got a whole lot more detail than it really does. Okay. And, and long story short, this is how we've been making things look good for a couple of decades now is by having the texture surface of what is a smooth object uh, respond to the light and the position of the camera in such a way that you s it's, it's, that you're seeing this swimming effect that gives you the optical illusion of depth. And it used to be that we would get very angry at artists who would develop, who would like make a tennis ball and make it look like this, and you say this is like fifteen thousand polygons, and this is like fifteen hundred polygons, you know. And it's like nobody's going to notice all this little edgy stuff here, and the lights just find us. Just give us, just put it in the bump map, put it in the normal map. So what is a bump map? A bump map is basically you take your image, okay, and you apply a, another, so you know, like a texture map is a graphic, right? It's like a two-dimensional, like 256 by 256 graphic. Parallel with your graphic, you have something that's called a normal map. And a normal map is basically a map for that, for every texel or every pixel in, inside of your texture map, uh, defines a vector that says what, the surface of this you know, texture looks like from that point. And if you Google normal map in Google Images and you look at it, you will see a field of images that are blue like this. Does anybody have an idea of why normal maps are typically blue? I'll tell you. <laughs> so a normal is a vector, right? Three-dimensional vector. Okay, and it's being encoded in a graphic for submission to 3D hardware, it's, it's a it's a graphical input, okay, and it's a it, and and the, the the fields for a graphical input are red, green, and blue, right, and so when you make a normal map, what you're doing is you're taking a butt map, and you're saying, well, give me all the the normals of, the, of this like crunchy surface, virtually all of them point up, so the z value of the vector, right is almost always positive. And the z value of a vector is the b value of a color, right? And so normal maps, if you, if you go into Photoshop or whatever you see, make me a normal map out of this, make me a normal map out of that, you will almost always get these purple things. Now what that means is uh, uh, that we are losing a tremendous amount of the numerical resolution uh, for a bump map by <laughs> pretty much ignoring 180 degrees of the world, right? And saying we are never going to be in negative blue space, right? It's always going to be positive blue, right? And so there are a number of, uh, in, in, in the, 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 again, the Valve Guide, uh, there's a paper out there uh, on uh, remapping all these normals so that 100%, not, do you want two things? One, 100% of your space is being used. So a, a, a typical normal, you know, will, can be, might, might have a negative Z, positive Z, doesn't, you know, but it'll, it'll complete the entire range instead of just being this hemisphere, you know, basically half the range. Um, uh, and I lost my train of thought, so there you go. That's, that's basically, we, we solve for that problem. We say, okay, we want the, to, oh, and we want, we want the uh, um, frequency of normals to not bunch up so that like all of the normals kind of like just by the way we encode them you know, fit into one little cone and then some really esoteric normals that you'll never see fit along the side of the sphere. You want the totality of the sphere to hit the totality of the relatively narrow range of vectors. You can see that you don't get much more out of, you know, like the actual input is, is very, very limited. So what you're essentially doing is you are saying, okay, I, I know I have a relatively limited input, but I want it to map very evenly and very completely to the totality of the color space instead of to just the blue. However, on the video cards, that's not the way they work. They want just a normal map done in this kind of naive way. Uh, so you always have to make sure that you can unroll to that space for the, for the cards usages. Um, and if you write your own shader, 
you know, you can have a normal map in a different kind of format, but if you use the custom, the, the ones that come with the card or whatever, they're expecting these, these kind of blue normal maps. So that's why you'll, you'll kind of see this. Most people don't really worry about solving this problem, but if you do, it actually makes your, your textures work a little bit better. However, we have a problem as a little bit of an aside. Um, the other, so the other issue that you have to confront, okay, and I'll, and I'll show why, why these are problems. So that's the first thing. That's what a normal map is, okay. Uh, the, <coughs> the, the problem with normal maps, let me back up real quick on that. The problem with normal maps is in VR, when you go up to this, these two red balls here, this one looks great. It looks fine. It looks, it looks like the way it's supposed to look. This one looks terrible. It looks absolutely terrible. It does not fool your eye for a moment that this is an actual, that there's actual 3D uh, um, um, data here. It does on your TV. It does on your monitor. You don't pick it up there. When you go, but in, in VR, when you bring this up to your head, it looks like a flat 2D object with swimming film underneath of it, where this looks like a real object. So we have to solve this problem. We have to solve the problem of normal mapping. The other problem that we have to solve that kills you on VR is aliasing. Anybody understand aliasing? Heard about aliasing, anti-aliasing? Okay. So fundamentally, aliasing is a, uh, a side effect of the fact that we have uh, pixels on these systems that are square, right? Uh, and we have textures that are at a certain resolution, which are often fairly low. And we have uh, systems that will like create a line you know, like this, and it'll be very jaggy. And then what you do to kind of like soften the impact of that when you're sitting across a room or several, you know, like inches from a, from a monitor, <coughs> is that we go into the white spaces in, at the corners of the jaggy area and we sort of take an average of the values of the, pic of the pixels around it. And there's a bunch of different, there's bilinear filtering and all the different kinds of filtering that basically create gray, you know, shades that, that smooth out basically the <coughs> colors and it's again pretty good it's pretty good for it certainly works great on, on you know on monitors and everything else like that it just feels fantastic okay again um, and um, uh, the, the, the other the other element that you're looking at is that when you take a, a texture okay and you render it very very far away from the camera and you bring it down okay uh, you sample that texture, even if you alias your sampling, you know, through the roof, you get these weird banding, swirly, depending on where you've hit on the texture, things just look bad, right? So what you want is that textures further away have less detail in them and create more of a kind of a grayed <coughs> out result where you don't see all of that detail and you see all the detail kind of in the foreground where it really pumps up, okay? So this sampling, aliasing, and scaling of textures, bump mapping and normaling. All of this has been solved really, really well for consoles and PCs, for monitors and TVs. Uh, you guys don't even know that it's going on, do you? Right. Uh, looks god, god, god awful <laughs> on, on, my, on a VR uh, headset. It just swims, it, it hurts your eyes. Okay, because we're fundamentally, again, we are dealing with, like, you know, you guys go to the movies. You know when you go to the movies, you guys should ask for half your money back because you're only seeing half the movie. The screen is dark half the time. Okay, uh, you, it, because the shutter on the, on, the, on the projector has to close to allow the next frame to go into place. Otherwise, you would see, it would just be a, you'd see a falling rain of frames. Right, so the way a, a film projector works is we show you a frame, an uh, old film projector. The new digital ones, uh, I don't know exactly how they work, but the, the old film-based <coughs> ones, we show you the frame, and then we close off the, the shutter, we move the frame up, and we open it up again, okay? So you're only getting half your money's worth out of especially an old film-style uh, movie theater. Um, and that's the same kind of thing here. That flicker, when it comes right up on your face, or when, or when any like a, a fluorescent light interfer interferes with it, it hurts your head to see it. Okay, but when you're just in a movie theater where we have the right lighting environment and where there's enough, you know, because your eyes, coherency is what is keeping those black frames from showing up. Because the black frame does not last long enough for your eye to 
to settle out and you know your eyes fine with it so we have the same we've been solving these kinds of problems in computer games now for for a couple of decades computer graphics in general okay and none of them work in VR okay so we're kind of screwed um, the way that we solve the problem of the you know the the stuff in the distant horizon looking all swimmy is by something called mip mapping and mip mapping is basically where you take you say like I have a texture like that that wood there or this this you know uh, whatever and uh, I have a big version of it for up close that has a lot of detail and is very rich and looks good okay and then I have a kind of like I have like four or eight or 16 levels where they're cut in half each time you know and I guess it wouldn't be 16 but like four or eight uh, where each level down has less and less detail it's more smeary it's more you know whatever and and in the distance it looks like just kind of a gray blur that's vaguely of the, of the kind of color you want And as you come in the mip maps seamlessly blend from level to level based upon their screen space size so that by the time you get close to it you see all this rich incredible detail and you back away and that detail doesn't sparkle and it doesn't the sampling doesn't screw up and the aliasing doesn't screw up because as it drops down mip levels it gets less and less detail to it okay now this mipping approach is used on normal maps bump maps texture maps images everything that that affects the material okay and this is a typical problem of what we have with a with this is a uh, uh, a, a highly bump mappy specular object in a, for a 3D game that when you mip things down, mip down the normal maps, mip down the image maps, kind of in a straightforward, naive way, uh, what happens is that instead of this expected <laughs> glossiness that you get out of the, uh, you know, like, like if I'm looking at a glossy object that's across the room, I expect it to look pretty much like when I'm up close to it, right? What happens is that the specular highlighting begins to concentrate and concentrate and concentrate. Okay. And so getting further and further away from something, you see these little spot, you know, glowing spots on it. And again, by and large, today what we do is try to make our materials smoother. And it basically, you guys don't notice. It's, you know, you're, so there's some you know, ping pong ball over there or, you know, or billiard ball or whatever that's supposed to be very smooth. It's kind of a little not so smooth, but by the time you get close to it, it's very smooth. Once again, looks terrible in uh, in VR okay the, the, the these strategies that we've had for image processing just are not are not cutting it right now again th uh, this is taken from the valve talk uh, so he goes into a good deal of detail on strategies for solving these problems um, for for fundamentally making sure that we are rendering at a distance something that is you know, uh, going to look like the same thing up close. But what's really kind of been interest an interesting experience for us as we've developed these things is that all of these tricks and cheats and things that we've developed over the years that are, are you know, highly performant and uh, relatively good looking on TVs or whatever have suddenly become very uh, noticeably ugly and noticeably uh, unacceptable, you know, in this VR space, and there are solutions, you know, be, that that you can work on in the current hardware. Again, probably by the time you guys would get into this world, this will be solved, right? It'll say VR mip map. It'll understand this problem. All these problems, fortunately, are constant, you know. But these are the problems that we're facing today, you know, just like just like software rendering back then. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, right then uh, just my last comment here is that you know just looking back at 1997 looking back to the, the dawn of the modern video game era where we only really had one game imagine this we only had one game where you could run around inside a building looking in any direction at a high frame rate blowing each other away and now how, how many you know Call of Duty sequels and things like that are there the 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 uh, it, tremendous change in our culture of gaming that has occurred since uh, 97. We're at the dawn of a new version of this, where all of this old technology, it's all old now, right, that has been along for a couple of years, when you get the VR headset on there, you're going you're gonna to be seeing these, these cracks and these problems. And we have solutions coming up. Yes? Uh, 
Does any of this take into account the effects of the vestibular system on the motion of the head? Because if you have nothing to fixate on uh, with your eyes, uh -huh. it's completely blank, and you move your head, the semicircular canals will tend to keep your eyes constant. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll say my PhD dissertation was on this topic. Sure. So, so, and I'm wondering if any of this is taken. Well, maybe you account. can tell me. The biggest. So again, it, it's it's like anything else. The the biggest issue that we've had it has been uh, uh, latency and lag. Right. Uh, more. And, and that doesn't surprise me because yeah. the the vestibular system is incredibly. Uh, it's the the the, the, the incon inconsistency between the vestibular system and the ocular system is the problem. It is the exactly. fundamental problem. And the expectation also of the eye uh, for the behavior of materials at range is the problem. And the answer is like, yeah, th th that's, that's basically how we solve this thing. We have to say we need to fool the ear it, it is, is how we look at it. And it's like, how can we fool the ear uh, into, under, into accepting you, you the You can get motion sickness very easily with that. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we're in the midst of, of solving these problems right now. Thank you very much.